Well, we've come to class five, the last class of more data mining with Weka, and congratulations on having got this far. And uh, in this class, we're going to look at some miscellaneous things. We'll uh, have a couple of lessons on neural networks and the multi-layer perceptron. Then we'll take a quick look at learning curves and performance optimization in Weka. And uh, then we'll come back and have another look at the ARF file format before we do a summary in lesson 5.6. You've been listening to me talking for quite a lot of time now, and I just wondered if you might be interested in finding out a little bit more about me. If so, if you go to the web and search for a stroll through the gardens of computer science, in quotes, so you've got to get it exactly right, a stroll through the gardens of computer science, you'll get uh, just one result, or I got just one result, news from New Zealand. And uh, this, in fact, is an interview with me, an extended uh, interview, uh, starts on the next page, from New Zealand, a dialogue with me. And you will learn uh, where I came from, and what I've done, and what I've been doing, and what I'm thinking of, and some of my biases. So that might be interesting, or not, it's up to you. So let's get back to the lesson, lesson 5.1. We're going to talk about simple neural networks. Now, a lot of people love neural networks, and I'm not one of them. I think it's a brilliant term, neural network, because it kind of conjures up the image on the left of some really cool brain-like kind of mechanism. But actually, you should think of the rather grungy picture on the right. Uh, a linear sum, we'll talk about that in a minute. The very name is suggestive of intelligence. However, the reality, I think, is not. Uh, so we're going to talk about the simplest in this lesson, the simplest neural network, the perceptron. And uh, it's a simple learning method that determines the class in a two-class data set using a linear combination of attributes. For test instance A, that is with attributes a1, a2, a3. Then we take the sum w0 plus w1a1 plus w2a2 and so on over all the attributes. We'll express that as a sigma from j as 0. We're implicitly defining a0 as 1 here just to make the notation nice. And if the result x is greater than 0, then we're going to say that instance belongs to class 1. Otherwise, we're going to say it belongs to class 2. And this, of course, works most naturally with numeric attributes. So where do the weights come from? That's the big question. You have to learn them. And here's the algorithm. We start by setting all weights to zero. And uh, until all the instances in the training data are classified correctly, we continue for each instance in the training data. If it's cl classified correctly, then we do nothing. If it's classified incorrectly, then if it belongs to the first class, we'll add it to the weight vector. And if it belongs to the second class, we'll subtract it from the weight vector. And there's a theorem that if you continue to do this, the perceptron convergence theorem, it will converge. You need to cycle repeatedly through the training data, perhaps many times. And it will converge providing the problem is linearly separable. That is, there exists a straight line that separates the two classes, class one and class two. Actually, we talked about linear decision boundaries before when we talked about support vector machines. They're also restricted to linear boundaries, but they can get more complex. You can get more complex boundaries using the kernel trick, which I mentioned but did not explain back then in Data Mining with Weka Lesson 4.5. And I'm not going to explain it now, but I'm just going to tell you that the perceptron can use the same trick to get nonlinear boundaries. Now, the Weka implementation is called the voted perceptron, a slightly different algorithm. It stores all of the weight vectors, all versions of the weight vector, and it lets them vote on test examples. And uh, their importance, the weight vectors are themselves weighted according to the length of time that they survived before the weights got changed. You know, we're going to use a weight vector, keep classifying uh, uh, training instances, and then when the system makes a mistake, then we're going to change the weight vector. So the survival time is some kind of indication of how successful that version of the weight vector is. This is claimed to have many of the advantages of support vector machines, uh, but it's faster, simpler, and nearly as good. Well, we'll take a look 
Now I'm going to look at the ionosphere um, data set. So I've got it open here in Weka ionosphere. I'm going to go to classify, and the voted perceptron is in the functions category. And if I select that and run, the, there's a bunch of options, but we won't worry about that. Just run it using cross validation. I get 86%. If I were to choose SMO, then I would get 89%. So back to the slide for the German credit data, we also get slightly better performance with SMO. For the breast cancer data set, they're almost exactly the same. And for the diabetes, again, SMO is a little bit better. And it's certainly true that the voted perceptron is faster, maybe two times, five times, perhaps up to 10 times, depending on the data set. The perceptron's got a long history. It was uh, first published in 1957, the basic perceptron algorithm. And it was derived from theories about how the brain works. It's sort of an acronym for a perceiving and recognizing automaton. And the guy called uh, Rosenblatt published a book in 1958 called Principles of Neurodynamics, Perceptrons and the Theory of Brain Mechanisms. And very suddenly in 1970, it went out of fashion with the publication of a book by uh, two well-known computer scientists called perceptrons. And they showed that there were some simple things that perceptrons simply couldn't do. They proved theorems about what perceptrons could and couldn't do. And this is the cover of their famous book that basically took perceptrons off the map. Until 1986, when they came back, rebranded connectionism. The movement was a connectionist movement. And a couple of guys wrote another book, Parallel, Parallel Distributed Processing. And uh, some people claim that artificial neural networks mirror brain function, just like Richard Rosenblatt did back in the 50s. The uh, main form of perceptron uh, the, the connectionists use is a multi-layer perceptron, which is capable of drawing nonlinear decision boundaries using an algorithm called the back propagation algorithm that we'll look at in the next lesson. So here's the summary. The basic perceptron algorithm implements a linear decision boundary. It's kind of very reminiscent of classification by regression. It works with numeric attributes. Uh, and it's an iterative algorithm. And it depends on the order in which it encounters the training instances. The result depends on the order. Actually, many years ago in 1971, I described a simple improvement to the perceptron in my master's thesis. Uh, but I'm still not very impressed with the perceptron stuff. Sorry about that. Uh, and recently, there have been some improvements. The uh, kernel, use of the kernel trick to get more complex boundaries, and this voted perceptron uh, strategy with multiple weight vectors and voting. There are some chapters in the textbook about this. And there's an activity which will get you learning a little bit more about this very simple perceptron algorithm. We'll see you in the next lesson. Until then, bye for now.